Is that up? Can you see that? Yeah. You see the slides? Yes. We're all good, Jay. Perfect. Okay. So what we're going to do today, and again, thanks everybody for joining. Yes. This is a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of uh, work to kind of get ready to go through this. Um, what I want to show is in, uh, and again, just so that everybody knows, I don't know, this is really rolling forward. Sorry, you guys. Let me get back. I don't want to, I, I'm just the president of the Rhinoplasty Society. And I've been in practice for a long time. Uh, and I just note that I went to medical school in Manhattan from 1990 to 1994. And I remember when HIV and AIDS, basically 50% of the population of New York hospital had AIDS or HIV when I was in medical school. So I have experience in terms of understanding that things have to be very different. And that's sort of the main theme I think today is how are they gonna be different? I'm not, not an infectious disease expert and I'm not a politician and I'm not a policymaker. And our goal today is not to make policy. Our goal is to discuss uh, options, thoughts and concepts so that people can have a good idea about how to return safely to practice in their area. A lot of this is locally dependent. Los Angeles is different from Bull, is different from Cleveland, is different from South America. So uh, again, this Rhinoplasty Society is a small group and I do appreciate everybody jumping on. We had a th over a thousand registrants. Um, and I do think that uh, we have some experience with rhinoplasty in our society. So hopefully we can really come to some ideas about how to go forward safely. The world is definitely different. There's no way to eradicate this virus. It's here to stay and patients want to have surgery. So with that, we must change. Everything has to change the way that we think and do things in rhinoplasty. And uh, Dr. Sajadian will go through why that is and same with Dr. Davis. You gotta be smart and be informed and know what's happening. I'm, I'm gonna say it again, it's locally and understand your patient and your operation. Test your patients, test yourself and test your staff. These are sort of my general concepts when I'm going into a, a rhinoplasty operation now. And this is a very key point. I've said it before, I'm gonna say it one more time that your patient has to be an active participant in keeping themselves and your staff safe. They can't just go along for the ride. They have to understand that the world is different too and that they are part of the solution to making it safer for everyone to have rhinoplasty. Uh, there's no right way and every, other world, every part of the world is going to be unique and customization is how we're going to have to see this. And what happens before surgery, the day of surgery, in the theater and after surgery all have to be considered long before the patient shows up. And so as people are returning to their practices, what you're going to do and it's your staff to do in all of these situations are crucial to the safety of the patient and yourself. Um, I think that our PCR is most specific, but we'll talk about the antibody test today. And, and uh, again, uh, we want to reduce the risk by knowing what's going on with everybody who's in surgery. It doesn't mean somebody's not going to get into the operating room who has COVID-19. It's going to happen. Um, these are the things that I'm doing. We'll go through them uh, very, very much in detail, but I think, again, it's all about testing. Uh, I'm gonna blow through the rest of these very quickly because we're gonna talk a lot about them. Uh, and again, I did a, a podcast with uh, my associate, Millicent Ravello. It's worth listening to because we've kind of, this is really good, I guess, if you're in Beverly Hills, it's probably very different if you're in Tallahassee, Florida. Uh, or Miami for that, that matter. And we'll hear from Rick Davis about that, but it is useful to listen and I want everybody to be safe. So with that, those are my opening comments and I wanna unshare my screen here and get, uh, let's get uh, Dr. Sajadian on. Thank you, Jay. So you should be able to go ahead, Ali. Okay, Jay, let me go in here. Let's see what Okay, thank you everyone, um, my friends and colleagues. Uh, I'd like to uh, quickly share a few ideas about how we can do rhinoplasty safely in the um, COVID era and some clinical um, consideration. Let me just time myself so I can stay on time. Um, are you seeing me? You okay? Yeah, okay. Thank you. Okay. So this overview of my talk, um, just a few words about the virus and why as rhinoplasty surgeons we are at higher risk and some clinical consideration and the strategies for increasing the safety and, uh, uh, and decreasing uh, risks. 
Um, as we know, the severe acute respiratory syndrome, COVID-2, is a highly contagious and has high morbidity and mortality compared to other coronaviruses. And as of last night, there was 4.4 million confirmed cases and over 300,000 deaths worldwide. And according to CDC, 28 states have reported more than 10,000 cases. And in America, we have 1.9, and in Europe, we have 1.8 million uh, cases according to WHO. So why, as rhinoplasty surgeons, we are at higher risk? There are four reasons for that. Uh, the sinonasal cavity is a major site of infection by SARS. And to understand why, um, we look at, look at the structure of the COVID-2, you can see a number of spike protein. And these spike proteins are where the virus is used to attach itself to the host cells. And these the receptors on the host cells are called ACE2 receptors. And the virus attaches itself to the respiratory cells in the, um, and specifically goblet secretory cells that produce mucosa is shown to have two proteins that the virus can attach itself to. Jay wanted me to specifically talk about that. So here it is, you can see the respiratory mucosa inside the, no the nose and nasopharynx, which has a high uh, level of spike protein. That's why the, the virus can propagate there very easily. Second reason is that there is a high level of viral shedding, uh, which appears to be highest at the nose, and therefore it reflects a major source of transmission. In a recent study um, just published a month ago, it showed that um, as, a, as a clinician, surgeons, uh, healthcare associated infection has happened and does happen with um, otolaryngology, oral surgeons, and rhinologic surgeons. And now it's considered to be, we are considered to be high risk for transmission. So that brings up to what Jay was talking about, which is the importance of screening test care of COVID-19 patients. Um, additionally, um, rhino rhinoplasty poses a unique challenge due to the potential for aerosolizing the virus. This is important. So as we know, uh, the virus can survive up to three hours and has an estimated half-life of one hour um, in the aerosol. However, on other surfaces can it still uh, survive for longer periods of time, which brings us to the point of um, cleaning and disinfection of the environment. And yesterday, WHO put out these guidelines uh, for outpatient and ambulatory care setting. So the question is, for our practical purposes, can we potentially learn from previous studies of the irrigation suction, aerosol data, laser data, or germ abrasion data to know what we should do? If you look at this uh, nice study was done by other colleagues in orthopedics, which showed that the irrigation suction during the operations was one of the major sources of aerosol. Other colleagues from the UPenn uh, Rhinology Division, which is virus surviving. So my own thoughts based on um, talking to a lot of colleagues is that this is just my own thoughts, not the guideline. Um, it, to, to minimize the particulate formation, you should consider looking to see if you should decrease the use of these instruments, such as microsaw, drills, birds, grass, shavers, physioelectric devices, and micro debriders. I also think that um, I, I used to use a dual splint in the nose. We should consider um, not putting nas intranasal splint to uh, minimize the intranasal uh, debridement in the office after surgery in the post-op period, and instead you use quilting sutures. Everything is done to minimize the risk. I, I know my other colleagues will be talking about strategies to minimize the risk, but as we know, virus is here to stay and the troubling potential for additional uh, waves of pandemic exists. So um, um, I joined these around the world should get together with some information on safety 
potentially be by utilizing cone beam CT, which has low radiation, until we have better um, treatment and vaccine available, and also um, figure out what the role of telemedicine is. Our colleagues in American Academy of Otolaryngology have also come up with some priority lists, and um, they put in septoplasty, septorhinoplasty in a routine priority. Our colleagues in uh, European um, Academy of Facial Plastic Surgery, uh, Dr. Saleh et al. has also come up with some guidelines for healthcare workers that come into contact with patients with COVID-19. Um, you can read this, but this is just if you have come into contact, but as a patient in the operating room, for example, we can use pledgets um, in the oral pharynx and nasal pharynx. Um, you have the patient preoperatively mouthwash with covidine uh, iodine solution. In conclusion, it's important to know the final nasal pathophysiology and um, know that this important site of infection and viral shedding is very high at that level, at that area. And repeated testing and screening are key to prevention and should come up with solutions with surgical strategies to minimize aerosol formation in OR and in the clinic. And um, we can learn every day um, about this virus and should come up with some um, local uh, and regional um, epidemiology uh, as a guide to have a focus action on this. I hope this was helpful to you all. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. Uh, I want to get a specific comment from uh, Dr. Guyron and from uh, Dr. Jeffrey Marcus. Uh, so Dr. Guyron, from your standpoint, uh, what are the key safety issues knowing that this virus is living in the nose and the pharynx and with the, the way that we do rhinoplasty with lots of suction, some use more bovi than others, uh, some even do laser turbinectomies. How are we going to be thinking about this going forward from your standpoint? Jay, thank you for inviting me. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Good evening those, for those of you who are from Europe. Uh, I think this is a... Uh, a very different era, and uh, Jay, you summarize a lot of things uh, very nicely, and uh, uh, I, 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 we need to think about the stages. First, we need, and the most important thing is uh, not operating on somebody who has a uh, virus and uh, doing a lot of, uh, taking a lot of steps to minimize a patient who potentially has the virus to get on uh, our operating room table. From there on, if we take enough uh, precautions, uh, the other changes are not going to be, in my view, as relevant because we're going to augment the safety of uh, uh, the operation by preventing a patient who has the virus getting on the table. What we do is, first, before the patient goes to the operating room, before the patient comes to the uh, facility, we take a history. We actually have a, uh, a page questionnaire. Where they have been, have they been ever in contact uh, uh, with uh, somebody who potentially had the virus? Have they been tested? Uh, and uh, uh, those are the factors that are going to actually isolate the patients. The surgeons and the patients all are uh, to monitor well, for temperature before, again, they, they enter the facility. And after they enter the facility, we all use masks. The patients use masks until they get to the operating room. And I, when you think about it, when the mask is on, I think the effect of the mask is grossly underestimated. In fact, had we taken the temperature of the patients, individuals who enter the country, had we uh, uh, advocated use of the mask, we would not probably have been where we are. When somebody has a mask on, it's not going to touch the face, it's not going to contaminate himself or herself or somebody else so easily. So uh, after the surgery, again, patients get the mask on, the surgeons and the staff all the time are going to have the mask on. So when we adhere so to these uh, principles, we're going to grow, uh, greatly reduce the potential for any, any patient, again, being operated on who was, who was potentially contaminated. 
uh, and intraoperatively, yes, uh, irrigation is going to help. Uh, uh, again, uh, we, we need to uh, reduce the droplets as much as we can. But I'm not going to ta uh, change my surgical technique and principles to that, in my view, make, may, make a difference uh, in terms of the outcome of the surgery uh, to minimize the uh, uh, infection because by then, if the patient is in the operating room with the virus, uh, I'm not sure that actually uh, having the uh, doses that may, would make or may not make a difference. Uh, so that those are the things that we need to, uh, all of the efforts should be on prevention. Thank you, Bauman. Uh, Dr. Marcus, can I get your uh, perspective as well? Yeah, thanks, Jay. Can, uh, can you hear me okay? Can you hear me, Jay? Okay. Okay, good, thanks. Yeah, I can hear you, um, sorry. So yeah, first I do wanna say thank, uh, thank you to Jay for uh, setting this up. And for those of you who participated in, in the organization, thank you for doing that and to the Rhinoplasty Society for acting as host. Um, it's, it's a critical time. Um, there've been a number of these webinars that we've seen um, from various places. RSC has had one uh, recently on the, on the South African Society. Uh, Rick was there and uh, had some really uh, valuable comments there as well. So um, there's a lot of information out there, and I don't necessarily think that we're going to know, um, you know, with finality what the long-term protocols are going to end up being. I don't know where we'll be specifically a year from now, so we're trying to work this out as we go, and we're doing the best we can. Um, your comment about knowing the local situation is, is very, very important because everybody has um, access to different resources depending on where they are and they have different problems also where they are too. Um, among those things, uh, access to testing. So to Bauman's point, you know, the best way to prevent having a problem in, you know, with a patient in the operating room is to um, prevent, that, prevent a patient with the virus from getting into the operating room. So I completely agree with all of those, uh, all of those things. And I, and I know we're going to get on to the issue about antibody testing and PCR. Um, I'll tell you one thing, you know, just from an institutional point of view, um, what we're here at Duke doing, you know, it's universal across our health system. Um, and, and you all have seen this, you probably have similar things in your own practices, but, um, you know, testing prior to surgery, in our case, it's, it's a 48 hour window that the, uh, that's mandated, but it's not just that the test be done and it's not just that it be PCR, uh, which is what Duke is requiring. Um, it's also where the PCR testing is being done because, the, uh, the quality of the testing is very much center specific to the, to the location and the facility that's performing the test. So why, we're gonna hear that you know, um, there's variations in the, in the sensitivity and specificity even with the RT-PCR technique. Why is that? Is it because um, they're, they're doing the technique different? Well, some of it has to do actually just with the facility itself and, uh, and the quality of, and cleanliness and processing within that facility. So, one um, uh, contaminant from one sample um, could potentially lead to contam you know, contamination within the facility. So for that reason, I can say, you know, um, my institution at Duke, they're requiring that the testing be done. And we have a short list of places where it can be done. It can be done at Duke. It can be done uh, uh, down the road at a facility run by the University of North Carolina. And also one that you probably, many of you may have access to is LabCorp. Um, these are facilities that Duke has determined um, are practicing within uh, the highest level. Um, and, and to that level, um, they're demonstrating a uh, 99%, um, uh, well, actually, a 1% false negative. So basically, somebody comes in, they get a negative test, they're negative. Um, and they believe, at least my institution believes, that if it's done in, in, in these facilities where they're, at least they're familiar with, uh, with the testing, that they're willing to accept that. Um, so within a private practice environment or wherever anyone is, you know, it, it'll be incumbent to find out where the highest quality testing is being done in the area and then come up with a protocol to, to use that. So uh, that's one thing I just wanted to, to lean in on. And then, you know, Rick had said the other day, um, you know, management of the turbinates is um, going to be one thing that will be challenging because the modalities that we use, whether I like to, I would normally favor the micro debrider technique and I would use Doyle splints um, uh, to hold them out of the way and prevent uh, Sinechia and so forth. But, you know, that's probably not something I'm going to be, I'm not, I'm not going to do. I don't know about others, but I'm, I'm, I'm probably not going to do that. 
um, doing uh, uh, turbinate reduction, partial turbinate reduction using the shears like I was taught when I was a resident. I'm probably not going to do that because the, the post-op care, it's not the intra-op care on that, it's the post-op care that's a problem, irrigations, crusting, and so forth. Um, so I think that probably I'm going to be um, led to do, uh, if you, you know, looking at the um, efficacy and, uh, you know, the long-term efficacy versus risk profile, if you look at, uh, at that, uh, that curve, we always talked about turbinectomy and microdebrider having the greatest efficacy uh, and also being a long-term, you know, success. Um, the one that uh, has the lowest long-term success um, seems to carry the least risk, which is turbinate out fracture. So there's very good likelihood that I'm going to be doing a fair bit of turbinate out fracture until I can figure out, you know, what is going to be the next, you know, the standard. So I, I started by saying a year from now, things may be different. But now that, you know, I'm operating now, you guys are all operating, I'm going to operate tomorrow. Uh, until I can figure out otherwise, I'll be, um, you know, lateralizing some turbinates. Let's, uh, on that topic, let's get to Rick Davis, because he has a lot to say about uh, safety and how he's looking at it, too. And let's, uh, let's continue those thoughts. Thank you both, Dr. Guyron and Dr. Marcus. Rick, you want to go ahead and share your screen? Got to unmute, Rick. We can't hear you. <laughs> Rick, you, I think you're muted. How about now? That's better. So I thank you all for uh, including me. I have nothing to declare and for once, I don't give a flip if somebody wants to take pictures of this, uh, that's fine with me. I'm gonna go quickly because I have a lot of data here. Some of it a little bit redundant. So we know that this disease is hallmarked by fever and cough. Those are the two most prevalent syst uh, symptoms and as Bauman wisely pointed out, you should screen them before they ever get to your office to make sure they don't walk in with active uh, symptomatic disease. A large per, uh, percentage of people who are infected will never get symptoms or experience such vague symptoms that they won't realize they're sick. So you should treat all patients as though they are infected. Those who are at increased risk for severe illness uh, include people with chronic lung disease. That's because the first uh, organ system to take a hit from this is the, is the lungs. And that's because the ACE2 receptors are very high in the lung, the kidneys, the liver, and uh, in the heart. Uh, for rhinoplasty patients, uh, lung disease might be asthmatics and younger people or people who smoke or vape. Cancer patients, whether they have active cancer or were treated in the past, are at a significant high risk, about a four, uh, excuse me, a five-fold increase over non-cancer patients for severe disease. Any immunocompromised patient, this is another major risk. That could be somebody just with HIV, even though it's com uh, compensated by medications or prior malignancy or various other reasons like chemotherapy or some underlying um, disease process. Hypertensive patients um, also are off occasionally seen in our patient population. This is the most common comorbidity is hypertension. So if you take all people who get symptomatic and get ill, uh, a great many have hypertension, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. That's number one, number two, and number three most common comorbidities. Cerebrovascular disease, chronic liver disease, rheumatic disease, and don't forget obesity, a body mass uh, index above 40 puts you at much higher risk. Transmission, we all know that it's either through a, uh, touching an infected surface and transferring it to your mucosa or through inhalation. And inhalation is believed to uh, be responsible for most uh, um, patients, uh, their mode of transmission. Uh, Live virions were detected on surfaces um, as much as nine days after uh, contamination, but most of them, it's about three days or less, depending on the type of surface. Incubation is the time it, from exposure to the time someone develops symptoms. And this can range from as little as 48 hours to as long as 25 days but the median incubation time is five days. There are uh, roughly close to 98% of people, if they're gonna develop symptoms, will develop it within about 12 days. It's believed that 86% of infected people go undocumented mainly because they don't know they're sick. 
but 18% of these people can still infect others. And that's why we've seen community spread so rampant. So again, treat everybody as though infected. Viral shedding begins about two and a half days before the development of symptoms. This is important because your testing window needs to be less than, less than that to, to have any kind of security that you're taking your patient to the OR without disease. The um, uh, shedding during the um, um, incubation accounts for almost half of disease transmission. Viral loads get worse after symptoms develop and they're most prevalent in the nose and nasopharynx for most of the course of the disease, at least in terms of what's gonna generate aerosols. You're not gonna get aerosols from the kidney or the liver or the brain or the heart or the, uh, to a lesser degree, the lungs, as much as you will from the nose or the pharynx. Symptoms generally resolve after 10 days, but shedding continues for up to two weeks later. And in the severely um, affected individual, there are 60 times greater uh, viral loads. So shedding is much more uh, problematic in these individuals. Once you become symptomatic, you have about an 81% chance of having a mild illness that resolves spontaneously and you don't need hospitalization. About a 14% chance that you'll end up in a hospital and about a 5% chance that you'll be fighting for your life. There was a study out of Wuhan that I think most of us are familiar with where they looked retrospectively at 30, uh, I think it was 34 patients that went to the OR with disease for uh, urgent surgery. Um, I'm actually quoting the wrong paper here. Um, this is in regard to testing. Nasal testing is very low sensitivity between 63 and 64 percent, but chest CT is up to 98 percent. So as an adjunct to a, um, a negative um, uh, PCR, you could also consider a CT of the chest because uh, even um, asymptomatic changes or patients can have radiographic changes uh, visible on chest CT. You know, is it worth the money and is it available? That's another issue. Nasal examination, instrumentation, even endoscopy and certainly surgery all stir the pot. They release uh, particles into the nasal cavum and then through the process of ventilation, inhalation and then exhalation, these viral contaminated um, particles are released into the ambient uh, environment much more so if a cough or sneeze develops. So as clinicians in the operating room during intubation, extubation, and all points in between, we need to do our best to avoid triggering coughs and sneezes in our patients. Because the uh, nasopharynx and nose are high reservoirs, there um, will be aerosolization to some degree and it can last for three hours if the air is static. But if you can keep the air moving, that's a different animal. General anesthesia is thought by many to actually increase the intensity or severity of a COVID-19 infection. Mask ventilation during intubation, positive pressure mechanical ventilation are thought to aerosolize the lower airways, um, driving the virus down into the alveoli, which are rich in these uh, ACE2 um, receptors. And general anesthesia also is uh, um, responsible for causing some measure of immune suppression. I haven't read the literature on that, so I can't comment, but apparently there is, it's fairly um, settled that some measure of immune suppression can occur in some surgical patients. After surgery, you know, uh, removing packing or manipulating the nose is just as high risk of procedure. And that has prompted the, uh, this uh, kind of ad hoc group of uh, head and neck surgeons to say that all elective procedures on the nose should be postponed. I don't necessarily agree with this and this was not a, um, a group sponsored by any organization that I think was just a, a group of surgeons that came together and published what they thought should be um, the restrictions. Here's that Wuhan study, 34 asymptomatic uh, COVID infected patients undergoing surgery. 
they uh, revealed a 20% mortality rate. However, the seven patients who, who succumbed were underwent major surgical procedures and had at least one pre-existing comorbidity with a relatively high median age uh, of those patients. I think this uh, group has the potential to shed a lot of light on what's happening. The International COVID-19 Surge Collaborative is a database which now holds almost 10,000 uh, cases. They admit uh, the data of any surgical patient who developed COVID-19 perioperatively uh, with symptomatic disease, whether they got infected before or after. The initial data on this came from 235 hospitals out of 24 countries. So it's, it's a very large um, a number of uh, facilities participating. They found that 26% of uh, uh, patients were infected before surgery, 74% developed symptoms after surgery, um, most of whom um, had uh, surgery for benign disease like an appendectomy, but a quarter of those were cancer patients and 20 of them were acu acute trauma patients. The overall mortality in this group was 280 patients. For elective procedures, it was slightly less and for emergency procedures, it was slightly more. But in this particular cohort, one in five people succumbed to disease. Half the patients, uh, developed pulmonary complications, and that put them in a higher mortality group of 38%, whereas the other half that got no pulmonary complications and tended to fare much better. This 38% is compared to uh, an expected uh, mortality rate of 8% from the pre-COVID era. The risk factors that they uh, identified are um, age being a big one, as is an ASA, uh, American Society of Anesthesiology categorization greater than two. Um, male patients, for some reason, there was a predilection for males. Cancer patients, clearly emergency and major procedures also, but whether you got the disease before or after the procedure did not have a bearing on your severity of illness. So some food for thought. Consider postponing elective rhinoplasty in patients who uh, have a high risk of exposure. Uh, you know, they haven't uh, been able to social distance or they've been traveling to uh, places that are hot spots or et cetera. Uh, patients with comorbidities, particularly elderly patients, that should be a consideration, uh, especially if you're in a hot spot yourself. The testing should occur as close to when scalpel meets skin as possible. You want your uh, test to be uh, valid and you don't want there to be a long interval between the test and when you operate it for no other reason that the patient um, A could become symptomatic and B uh, might get infected um, elsewhere. Um, avoiding power tools. You don't wanna use IV sedation because there's a chance that the patient might aerosolize more or cough or, or flail about. Awake intubation is uh, discouraged for the same reason. It's hard to get them numb and not coughing and moving. Uh, laryngeal mask anesthesia is felt to have an imperfect seal. So a cuffed endotracheal tube with a rapid sequence induction and probably spontaneous ventilation so you don't have to use positive pressure ventilation is uh, probably your best option. If you put lidocaine in the cuff, it'll help with extubation and minimizing cough. Um, using sequential compression devices to prevent DVT because the um, cytokine storm that develops as this disease progresses tends to cause multi-organ thrombosis. And this is why shunting occurs in the lung and one reason hypoxemia is so profound. It's not just ARDS, it's ARDS with thrombi and thrombi develop in the kidneys, in the liver, sometimes in the brain. And then there's myocardia, myocarditis in the heart and sometimes a significant elevation of isozymes um, and cardiac dysfunction leading to shock and death. If you have smoke evacuators, the kind that you would use on a laser procedure or a CO2 uh, procedure for laryngeal um, uh, HPV, 
then employ those. Um, you know, you could uh, tape the thing under their jaw and have it scavenge the aerosols that are coming out of their uh, surgical field. Betadine, I think Rod, uh, Rod's going to talk about this, so I won't go any further. Um, I agree with Jeff. I think, you know, uh, just bluntly out fracture the turbinate and uh, don't stir the pot there. You're more likely to get epistaxis and you do have wound care issues with that after the fact. Uh, nasal packing and splints should be avoided if possible and then you know, give some consideration if you're in the middle of a surge to waiting a bit for things to settle down. A cure a vaccine may be around the corner, it may not, but um, it is, you know, it is likely that at some point those things will be available. So these are my references. If anybody wants to do a, a screenshot, this last one down here is a YouTube link for this collaborative. They're going to have their first paper out in the Lancet. It's been accepted, but it's in press. And I spoke to the head of this uh, collaborative by email yesterday and stressed the fact that the other end of the spectrum, the low risk patients need risk quantification and they're working on that as we speak. So with all that, I thank you and uh, turn it over. Great, thanks, Rick. That was excellent. Uh, you really hit the uh, the highlights from the data standpoint, and that's uh, that's perfect. Because well, and, all, and all of it's referenced from from research. Although, admittedly, you know, low it's kind of crappy science, not by design but by necessity. There are small patient cohorts. Most of those were retrospective studies, and it, it's not exactly um, the best data, but it's the only data. So. It is what it is and take it with a grain of salt. Well, we will discuss that in a second because what I wanted was for Dr. Most to go through what they're doing at Stanford since they've been uh, really uh, hot on this and he's uh, literally at the epicenter of what's going on in Stanford. So I uh, want him to, to take us through what's going on there and then we're going to talk about this in a panel discussion right after Dr. Most. So go ahead, Sam. Sure thing. Thank you so much uh, for having me. Thanks for organizing this, Jay. I'm going to share a screen now and make sure this works. You guys see that okay? Good, yeah. Okay. All right, so hopefully this advances here. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what we're doing here in Stanford in the Bay Area. Did that slide just advance for you? It did, yeah. Okay, good, all right, so I wanna make sure. So my only disclosures are I have since uh, my illness invested in a couple of companies that have uh, therapeutics. I'm not gonna talk about them in this talk. But the main things uh, that I wanna say, the take home messages, are things you may have heard already. You know, this is a brand new pathogen, a brand new disease process. And Jay's um, relating what happened with HIV in the 90s or 80s and 90s is very interesting to me. The evidence base is very thin at best. It's developing on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, there were headlines a few weeks ago that said smoking actually protects you. Uh, there were headlines that said that if you take ibuprofen, it's actually worse for you. So, I mean, these things, there's so much evidence flying around without much to stand behind. So I just think you have to really be careful what you say, because what we think is true today might not be true tomorrow. We cannot create absolute recommendations for best practices until we know the truth. But if we keep the best interests of our patient, staff, and community in mind, uh, we will do the best by our patients and our community. You have to look to your local governments and hospitals for recommendations for your community. What I talk about, uh, what's happening here at Stanford isn't necessarily true for what's happening across the Bay or up in San Francisco. So, you know, it's really, really very localized. Okay. So what to avoid, you know, I'm just gonna say this, don't make assumptions based on thin or no evidence. Don't make countrywide or worldwide recommendations and do not make all encompassing, all encompassing statements or guidelines. Unfortunately, this was just published. I'm just gonna say it because I know it's on everyone's mind and it's been controversial. And I think that these authors may have had the, their heart in the right place, but what they've written does look like it's some sort of all encompassing guideline. And, and I know some of these folks are very nice folks and, and very wise, but I think this, this may lead to some problems. Um, you know, the countrywide goal and the worldwide goal is to flatten the curve so that the healthcare system capacity is not overwhelmed. Uh, you've seen that, that get overwhelmed in places like uh, Northern Italy uh, and in New York. Uh, and fortunately, we were able to avoid that here in California. I'm going to talk a little bit about this. 
This is the status. We had 52,000 cases when I gave the talk for the Rhinoplasty Society of Europe a couple weeks ago, and now we're at 76, almost 77,000 cases. Uh, and what's happening up here in Northern California isn't necessarily the same as what's happening in Southern California, and that's going to dictate what happens. Um, here shows the hot zones by um, actual cases per 100,000 people. You can see in that uh, regard, the Southern California area is a lot hotter right now. Uh, and if you look at statewide case statistics by county, uh, and this is shown here on the left side, you can see Los Angeles County has almost half of the entire cases of the state of California. Um, and my county is Santa Clara, which is 2395. It's about fifth or sixth on the list. Uh, and so we have far fewer cases, although we were one of the first places to have the outbreak uh, occur uh, that was documented. And if you look at by hospital, number of positive cases by hospital, again, LA has got almost 1,700 cases. Uh, and down here at Santa Clara is only 48 cases uh, total of people that are hospitalized that are known COVID positive. So uh, definitely um, different areas are going to have different statistics. And based on that, you're going to have different recommendations. These are, as of yesterday's numbers, um, uh, what the uh, number of cases and deaths looks like in California. And I think this is of interest because if you look at the shelter in place date, which was about March 19th, you can see there's a two week lag before the number of cases shown in this left graph began to level off. And the deaths, of course, occur a little bit later. So it takes a little longer for that curve to start to flatten. And what's more relevant to us here at Stanford is what's happening in the Bay Area. Uh, and in the Bay Area, shelter in place was instituted on the 16th of March. And again, about two weeks later, the curve started to flatten. And for us, it's in fact going downwards in terms, in terms of number of new cases, and our death rate has uh, flattened out. Um, and importantly, in terms of resource util utilization, uh, in California, they estimate, this is the website reference for this is here on the bottom, the estimated the number of uh, ICU beds available is about 2,000. And we were never overwhelmed and we flattened out now around 800 beds being used. So there's plenty of resource availability, which is going to dictate when tier one surgeries can occur. And that's shown again in this slide, which I'm going to zip through. And then in the Bay Area, you can see that, um, that the resource utilization of ICU and non-ICU beds uh, is going way down for COVID patients. So in that setting, um, CMS recommendations regarding uh, which types of surgeries to do included tiers one through four, which we're all familiar with, uh, and um, you know availability and uh, especially availability of ICU beds was very important. Supply of PPE to the system and urgency of the procedure were all things to consider. And uh, about two weeks ago, tier one surgeries were opened up at Stanford University, um, include not including cosmetic surgery at that point. Uh, and so basically any surgeries that were non-cosmetic were allowed to be to occur. Um, and I'll talk about the testing protocol for these. And this included functional rhinoplasty, by the way. Um, you know, what we want to do as surgeons is make sure that patient safety and staff safety intersect when we take a patient to the operating room and when we see patients in our clinic. And I think this study, which is the one that Rick mentioned, is something that's worth talking about because it's, it gets quoted a lot. Uh, and this was a retrospective multi-center review at the height of the epidemic in a center uh, in uh, Wuhan, and they identified 35 patients who had COVID symptoms or COVID without pre-op symptoms. The problem is the denominator was never identified, so you don't know how many of these people or how many people they actually had in the entire study, so you don't know what percentage of people without testing were showing up in an endemic area uh, with this, because what we want to do is avoid taking patients to the OR who are positive. Uh, and no patients were being tested pre-op at that point. So this is a figure from the study, and as Rick mentioned, 15% of these, uh, sorry, 44% of these people ended up in the unit, and 21% ended up uh, dying. All the deaths were in major surgical procedures, like major abdominal surgery or hip replacements and things like that, and all of these patients had uh, comorbidities. Uh, so what are we doing at Stanford? We want to avoid that type of situation. Of course, that risk uh, is not does not uh, work for us uh, for this type of elective surgery. The first thing is uh, patient preparation. And again, as, as Bowen said very nicely, the goal is no COVID positive patients should enter uh, the clinic uh, or uh, the surgical suite uh, any, any, in any way because of the risks that that engenders. We will treat patients like they are positive and take and be careful, but still we don't want to even have them in there. 
take steps to minimize the above. So for us at Stanford, our protocol, we have okayed uh, cosmetic surgery and it's been okayed by the Santa Clara, our county health department as well, is as follows. In, in patients in whom you're going to do a non-powered instrumentation surgery in, in the nose, uh, we do PCR COVID testing 72 hours ahead of time. In our testing at Stanford, there's a known 4% false negative rate. These patients are quarantined, they're already quarantining. And as the quarantine is lifted, uh, in the county, we have to come up with a number like seven to 14 days for these patients to be quarantined uh, that we require for them. Uh, and if they fail to do that, we can do a rapid test, which is thought to have uh, a similar, not quite as good false negative rate. If you're doing powered instrumentation rhinoplasty, non-intranasal, uh, so in other words, piezo on the bones or things like that, we will uh, double test these patients. Uh, 72 hours ahead of time, they quarantine, and we do a rapid test, so double testing. So the likelihood of a false negative getting through uh, becomes extremely low. I'm no statistician, but it becomes extremely low. For rhinology and skull-based surgery, I'm just going to mention, I don't do that type of surgery for uh, that. You know, intranasal aerosolization risk is higher, but uh, it's the same testing protocol for them. If the patient uh, isn't positive and they're not doing some emergent skull-based surgery, they do not wear PAPR, by the way. Um, patient preparation, I'm gonna mention betadine. I think that uh, Rod's, Dr. Rourke is gonna talk about this at length. Uh, there's some evidence for virucidal activity uh, and studies are underway. The references for this are down below. In transacemic acid, I think he's gonna talk about as well. And there's a study on that uh, as well. So those are things that I'm not doing yet, but I may consider doing, and you may wanna consider doing if there's no downside. From a surgeon point of view, everybody who enters our facility, who works at our facility, or who is coming as a patient, and by the way, only patients are allowed in, not other visitors, uh, are screened with the screening questions that are pretty standard, and temperatures are taken. In addition to that, for all of us, um, we're, we're tested uh, with a PCR and so on. During surgery, we wear eye protection, surgical mask, and there's a HEPA filter on our suction, so that addresses that issue. Um, nasal surgery, the same type of thing, except we wear an N95. This is true for all mucosal surgery, intraoral, even eye surgery, uh, eyelid surgery. Um, and you have to make sure your OR has adequate air exchanges and you have a HEPA filter on your suction again. And rhino, uh, rhinology, it's the same. Uh, as I mentioned, all staff are screened before entering. All of us have been PCR tested. I've been tested four times, actually. Um, and antibody tested, we can debate whether that was really useful or not. I know epidemiologists don't think so. Uh, and everybody's screened every time they enter the hospital. So our goal again is to, is to keep the, our patients safe and to keep the community safe by not overwhelming the healthcare system capacity. And I think you're gonna hear the message a lot that you know today we're gonna to talk about and have a discussion about things, um, but evidence is thin at best. Again, what we think is true today might not be true tomorrow. Uh, and we have to uh, avoid creating absolute recommendations until we know the truth. Uh, the best interests of our patients, staff, and community are what we have to keep in mind. And you have to look to your local governments and hospitals for recommendations for your community. What happens at Stanford isn't necessarily what's going to be working for you uh, elsewhere in California or elsewhere in the country or the world. Uh, and we want to avoid making uh, wide encompassing statements and guidelines at this point. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Most. Uh, it's very, uh, you know, the, there's so many issues and I do want to, um, I want to have a couple of the panelists weigh in uh, because, you know, again, at Stanford, that's a, it's a major league institution. And then most plastic surgeons are going to be in uh, private practices and, and doing these in, in small outpatient surgery centers where things may be a little bit different. Uh, in fact, why don't we go uh, right to Dr. Uh, Gavami, if you could unmute your uh, mic and uh, tell us, uh, Ash, how you're, you're approaching it in your facility at this point. Yeah, thanks, uh, Jay. Thanks for letting me be a part of this. I think, um, you know, especially being in Los Angeles, as Sam was talking about, it seems to be relatively a hotbed, but actually the numbers he gave me were encouraging because I know that it was a hotbed in uh, Northern California first. So seeing that Northern numbers have gone down, ours has gone up, means that we're, on, we're next on the list to go down. So I think we are past the curve. And that's why the governor of California did not issue an extension 
for certain phases like elective surgery not going on and didn't use the verbiage of cosmetic surgery not happening after May 15th because the last published date in the state of California to, to at least start phase one was May 15th and he didn't extend that. He just extended overall what's happening. Just today I was driving, the farmer's market which has been closed for two months was open. Um, grocery stores still have six feet outside lines. So the bottom line here is there's some liability here, you know, aside from us wanting to do the right things for our patients, there's liability with our staff. There's liability with patients. I don't know about uh, Europe, Italy, and Turkey, but there's a lot of lawyers and they're hungry and that have been out of work uh, for the past two months and they are hungry. So um, it won't be hard for a disgruntled staff member to get a hold of a lawyer that's just, even if they don't win, just the nuisance to your practice, just the fact that everyone in your practice knows you're being sued by an employee might give them ideas. If a patient hears about it, God forbid you're popular on social media. I always am concerned about that. Inherently, you're a target if you're known um, because the way they bring you up is the way they bring you down. So let me go through what I'm kind of doing in my practice briefly, and I might share my screen to show you my waiting room and some of my forms, but we have a questionnaire, a lot of what Sam said we're doing, and it's basically a slightly toned down version of what Sam is saying, because Sam's working in a, a hospital-based, university-based institution. I'm in a private practice, outpatient surgery center clinic on two separate floors in a, in a tall building in uh, Beverly Hills. So uh, let me share my screen and I'll show you. So we have a questionnaire. We have um, anybody who's walking in my office has a PCR test that has been uh, enough time has passed that if it was a false negative, that some symptoms would show. So we're not allowing anyone that's uh, coming from outside of California that has to fly, to fly in unless they have a private jet. So I actually have, in two weeks, I'm operating on someone who's coming by private jet with just one person with them. So that's very different than flying commercial, going into the airport, being exposed. The way I see it, we're gonna have this risk, second wave or not, indefinitely for a long time and it, you, we could do all the testing everything we want all it takes is one brother cousin or family member that lives in the house with our patient to go to the grocery store not be cognizant of what they're doing with their hands and transmit that and then because we are the ones that have the money and we are the target we get blamed now it's going to be very difficult to trace it back to us for liability but it's an issue we have to talk about how we're going to do it and i think the main way that we can battle unscrupulous opportunist liability issues is for all of us to be on the same page. If we have a, the same page, all the rhinoplasty society surgeons and at least the large majority are all practicing around the same time period during this phase. And we're all in cognizant that we're doing everything we can in our practices and we're doing some version of what Sam just talked about for our outpatient surgery centers then that power of numbers is good because we can use that data and that information as a way to say, look, I'm going with the norm of what my other colleagues are doing. I'm not an outlier. I'm not doing something um, extravagant or crazy. So let me just share screen and I'll just kind of see if I can share multiple uh, images. Well, I'll just show the video. Um, just share it down at the bottom there. Yeah. So here's a, 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 can you guys see that? Yes. So you guys can see this, is my waiting room. We have some of the chairs blocked off so you can't sit. So we went ahead and measured actually within the waiting room so that you can't sit next to someone else. Now, if somebody comes with somebody, we're discouraging that. If they have to, that person needs to be COVID tested as well. We treat them as if they're a patient and they can sit next to each other, for example, right here. Now, let me share uh, my desktop. Um, let me just share my desktop. That'll be easier. So here's my desktop. You can see here this video. You guys see that video? So you can see in this video, we're showing the, the waiting room. And then I also have plexiglass in front, just like they do at the grocery store. Here's our station with temperature thermometer checking. We're checking everyone before they enter the space. They have to knock on the door. And here's the plexiglass in front of the uh, receptionist uh, desk. Could you all see that? Yep, looks perfect. Okay, so 
Um, I won't bore you with my forms, but essentially nobody is coming into my space in the surgery center. And I think honestly, the outpatient surgery center, if it's well controlled, is one of the most controlled, possibly safest places to be for someone to walk into. And that's what I'm telling my staff because no one's walking in there without COVID negativity status with PCR. I do think I ordered 200 um, IgG uh, antibody tests and I sent them back because the data is not strong enough and I think it could confuse people. It'll give you a false sense of security that you're immune and you may not be. And God forbid you're positive IgM, but let's say it's a false positive and you're COVID negative and then you have to miss work for two weeks. Guess who pays for that two weeks off? Uh, so there's a lot of issues that don't make sense with um, antibody testing right now. So I think PCR questionnaire and then all patients, you know, ASAPs and ASPS and different society have sent out consent forms. And I'm using some version of those consent forms with some additions that they're basically saying, look, I'm taking a risk being a patient right now. I know that it's a risk. But as Rod Rorick says, thank God for plastic surgery. People still want plastic surgery. But if we do give into and, and kind of start going away from each other during this era, um, it's going to be a problem to restart. And the last thing I'll say is, you know, and this is really encouraging. I just did some math. So Sam Most was saying that 1,600 people in Los Angeles are hospitalized. 1,600, okay? Sounds a lot when you say it on Channel 4 News. Now, if the census is correct, which we know census are always low, there's illegal immigrants that don't count. A lot of people don't fill out that they're, I have never filled out a census and I'm a family of four. So there's four right there, not in the census. You're in trouble now. No, that's yeah, right. You just said it on tape, man. They're coming that's for you. That's all right. I, I lost the form. <laughs> I don't know. My dog took it somewhere. But yeah. um, there's about 10 to 12 million people by census in LA. So I would venture to say there's closer to 15 to 20 million. So let's just be conservative and say the census is correct. If the census is correct, then there's 12 million people in Los Angeles. And I like the hospitalization data because hospitals have to record that. And that's accurate data. If you're hospitalized, you're getting recorded. Hospitalized COVID patients, 1,600, 12 million in Los Angeles. That means hospitalization rates right now in Los Angeles is 0.0001333. So Not I, mean, a whole lot. I, I would venture to say that's got to be similar to the seasonal flu at this point. So we really need to be careful. That study that came out that I just have in front of me um, that uh, Rick Davis and Sam quoted, I think it is dangerous for us to go and publish things like this because lawyers think if something's on paper and it's published, it's something they can use. We have to be very careful what we publish. But um, so that's the gist what I would say to that. And then I think we're having a discussion at the end as well. At the end, we'll, yeah, we'll round about. And I appreciate it, Dr. Gavami. I'd also like to hear from Dr. Uh, Nazem Turkish about uh, what Istanbul, is there any major differences in your neighborhood uh, in Turkey that uh, you could note based on what we're doing here in the U.S.? Well, <clears throat> well, we haven't started the surgeries yet because the government do, do not recommend the elective surgeries. So, uh, the, but there are some surgeons illegally are performing here on, on the hospitals. And uh, in Turkey, we, uh, you know, we, we, the, we operate usually in the hospital base, different than the United States. We don't have the uh, office uh, operating room facilities. And uh, I think uh, for, uh, for me, the, you know, the most important thing is uh, to prevent the patient. And I'm not thinking to start the surgery right now uh, until the government recommends uh, us to start. First, secondly, uh, I'm not thinking that I will be able to perform a good rhinoplasty uh, with the shield and the N95 mask and together with my uh, magnifying loops. It seems to me it's uh, not like uh, impossible because I, I, I started to see patients doing Botox fillers in the office and even, uh, you know, doing a Botox or filler with, with that mask is, is really tough for me. So if the quality of my results is going to uh, be bad, why, why to do that surgery? So I'm, I'm going to wait, uh, wait so far. 
in uh, in overall Turkey numbers uh, are decreasing uh, every day. Istanbul is the epicenter of the uh, epidemic in in Turkey. As we have today, the number of new cases was 1,600, and the total of we have 4,000 that so far. Uh, not not too bad, and the hospitals were. Uh, were not really overwhelmed. I have friends in the uh, state host government hospitals working at uh, the ICU units. They say that half of the beds are empty. So, uh, so you have to try out that. Uh, surgery, I'm million? going to take all the measures. Pardon me? Did you mean 16 million or 16? You said 1,600 patients. 1,600 4, new case, new case, detected case with the PCR testing. You know, all in one day, 1,600 new cases in the okay. 80 million population. Mm -hmm. And the total of the cases, like uh, 200,000 That I calculate that five times more or 10 times more the people got infected. Still, we are uh, around 2% percent, percent of population who got the virus. And uh, so uh, the risk actually pretty low uh, to operate a COVID patients undertaking the necessary measures with PCR testing 48 hours before the surgery. And we, uh, in the uh, elective surgeries, uh, like orthopedic surgeries, they do at hospitals, they do uh, lung, CT for every case, because uh, one, in one patient without symptom, they detected uh, COVID and the uh, uh, lung symptoms, and uh, they found out that uh, the patient is uh, COVID positive, even though she, uh, the patient do, don't have any symptoms. So I think I believe that uh, chest X-ray is important, and uh, we taking all the measures, uh, you know. Maybe I'm going to start to surgeries a month later when the numbers goes down significantly. Uh, my risk will be, uh, will be less. Of course, I cannot uh, ag be agree uh, with uh, more, more, uh, more uh, from Ashkan uh, because it's more important to, uh, to prevent the patient and the uh, not uh, to be blamed by the patients and then not to, uh, to get sued uh, with operating a COVID patient. Well, with that said, I think we should uh, move into the legal issues. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Rod Rorick today to uh, take us through some of the uh, legal aspects and what he's doing in Dallas to uh, really minimize the risk for patients and also to control the liability as best we can. So thanks, Rod, for joining us. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. And um, everybody see it? Yes. Okay. All right. You see my screen? Yes, we do. OK, yeah, perfect. So, yes, you know, I think it's I think uh, I'm going to go fairly rapidly through some of this because so many of you have already uh, talked a lot about some of the points that I, I think are very important. And I'm going to talk a little bit about these, but the key is this is preliminary. These are safety things that are preliminary. And I think we can't overemphasize that. And these are my disclosures. And um, But, you know, it's a rapidly moving target. I mean, and, and everybody's been through this uh, before, but, you know, for us, it's in Texas. You know, Texas actually has been very uh, fortunate. We've actually... We're, we've been back since uh, May, um, we've I've been operating since May 4th. I've done uh, 10 uh, rhinoplasties and I'll just share you with my experience. And so we've been fortunate because in the USA, of course, it's been in the New York and Northeast area and the, and the Northwest. And in the number of cases we have, it's actually been a, a plateau. We, we're testing now 20 to 30,000 Texans a day. So our number of cases of positive have gone up, but our hospitalizations have gone down and so have the deaths. So that's actually a good thing. And we never, just like uh, Sam said, we never had a problem with insufficient PPE or hospital beds or ICUs because that's one of the, the key things that everything is local before you resume elective surgery. So 
everything I'm going to say is about local Texas and some USA. And we have these rigid uh, practice form that we actually, be before we started, I met with every one of our, our team from the, our, our day surgery center, our hotel, and our skincare center. We have uniform criteria that are, are mandated by all. And that's very important. And that includes the rigid screening and testing. As soon as you get off the elevator, you come and you get tested and you get your temperature. And that's just uh, foregone. And then we don't have waiting rooms, so we don't tape anything off because we don't trust anybody. We don't have refreshments. We've cleaned out the magazines. I've canceled all my international patients for the next three months. And if they come from the USA in a hot spot, they have to quarantine in Dallas for two weeks. We're at about uh, a fourth the pace we were last week. And this week we went to 50%. So, and then we disinfect all of the touch areas in every room, of course, after every patient. And so everybody's screened and scripted and we identify the high risk patients. And I think what Rick said is so important. We don't operate on high risk patients now. And uh, what uh, Jay said is, uh, he added me to ask, uh, add this thing about the legal considerations. I think, of course, you know, the pandemic that always occurs after any type of thing like this, we can guarantee it is going to be the legal pandemic, okay? It won't be the secondary surge that we can guarantee. So always take care of patient safety first. Protect yourself, the patient, and your staff. And do the right thing, you know, guidelines and standards of care. Be very careful. We want to not talk about that. We need to talk about preliminary uh, recommendations that are fact-based, not even evidence-based, but not bias-based. And I think that's really where we get into trouble. Because the science, is, as Sam talked about, is changing so rapidly. There's no dogma. Look at that. We talked about testing, no testing. Well, testing's mandated. Well, now it doesn't mean much. Masks, no masks. Now we do masks. I mean, this is so elusive. So we have to remain evidence-based, not emotion-based. And never say, I believe, because we're not preachers or ministers, but we have to say, this is what I know. And this is the one thing that I might ever, I always tell myself, I've never in my life said, I don't know so many times. And I think that's okay. But this was recently in, in, the, in the Washington Post. Okay, because the second wave definitely is coming and it may not be the pandemic from coronavirus, but it's gonna be the lawsuit, lawsuit wave. So just wait for it. So it's gonna hit us soon, just like it did with all the ALCL and the breast implants. So the key is no dog must, must be preliminary and safe fact and evidence-based. And it's okay to say, I don't know. And I think that's very important. That's why we need to really not veer from making some guidelines or cogent recommendations and things that really probably are not even evidence-based in any manner. So we need to be very careful when we do that. I like both the consents from the ASPS and ASAPs. I like the AS ASAPs one a little better because it's a little more down to earth, but I, I have them sign it both for my staff and my patients. Now that doesn't guarantee anything, but at least it tells you and tells them that you've informed them you're following these rigid guidelines. That's the one thing that'll protect you because somebody is gonna get COVID, whether it's your staff or your patient, that's just inevitable but at least you followed the same rigid guidelines. The daily staff screening, everybody including us gets that. If we have a temp above 99.6, you go home. And the same with the patients, we, they're rescheduled. So my manager talks to all of these patients and has a questionnaire before. They're not like, I recently had a patient that was coming from Boston and, uh, and I, 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 I canceled her because she couldn't, you know, I, I said, until you're back in Dallas for two weeks. So virtual consults, I mean, obviously that's still something we do, but I do more follow-ups now. I only see my post-ops and new patients now, and they all come alone unless, they're, unless they are a minor, no one comes with them. We text them, we, we text them from the car. Everybody gets a surgical mask from my office, not the one they wear, the cloth mask, which is about 30% effective. So we get them a surgical mask. And we don't operate on these minimum and high-risk patients as, as uh, Rick mentioned. And I don't operate on sleep apnea patients either. All of these high-risk patients I'm pushing out for the next several months. And hopefully when things clear, and I think that data that Rick presented was uh, interesting, but I think it had too many variances to actually be validated. I know it's gonna be published, but, um, but the screening I think is important. The fever is important. So let's talk about what I do preoperatively. So I think the chest CT, uh, PCR and antibodies are the big things. I'm, I don't do chest CTs. Uh, and I think it's great. I think it's certainly in the symptomatic patient. The whole thing on multiple uh, testing modalities is the, the biggest thing I can say here is we really don't know their sensitivity and reliability. You know, when the FDA lets anybody do tests without truly validating them, that's the problem. And, and I'm not, 
I'm not uh, saying that's bad, but it, it was been a pandemic. So we do uh, the, um, the PCR test because it measures the current infection, we hope. But how accurate is it? And this has been talked about several times. The, the deeper you go down in the nasal pharynx to the lung, the higher the rate of positivity. So it's not only the test, but how deep and how well you get it. If you go back to the nasal pharynx, you do a, a bronchial lavage, then that becomes very accurate. So that is also determined by how accurate your PCR is. I mean, there are um, universities now that are, not, are throwing out the Abbott machine because of the 15% false positive rate. So the bottom line on these, all of these PCR tests is yes, it's the most accurate thing we have, but it's probably got a 15% variance one way or the other. So I guess if you repeat it within 72 hours, that does increase its accuracy a lot. But just remember, you know, in essence, you know, you're, you're looking at a 70 to 85% accuracy rate, but you treat them all like we do it in AIDS. We treat them all like they're positive. And then that protects you and the patient. And if they have any symptoms, just delay them. So I think that's the most important thing. So for now, it's the PCR. That's what we do. And uh, we, we don't do the antibody tests and we don't do imaging. Um, and obviously that's done in the hospital. And the antibody tests, I'm gonna go over real rapidly because we basically know that the problem with the antibody tests is that their sensitivity and variance is so um, broad in spectrum that it's almost meaningless. And also when the IgM uh, elevates and the IgG, that, that's when you have a problem with it, the, the sensitivity of the test. So the quality and reliability, even by CDC, is basically unknown. So basically, uh, I've had two uh, antibody tests for my staff and uh, myself, and you know they've all been negative. But I don't think it means anything. None of them are truly FDA approved, and that's the problem. So uh, with these antibody tests, I would say let's not get a false sense of security. So what do we do? We do PCR. We do immediate pre-op screening. We do temperatures, and we we measure the current state of infection. And the key thing is the screening with fever and all of the CDC expanded symptomatology. Then the day of surgery, what we do is the, they're met and they come by themselves and they're met um, with a series of questions and a temperature. Again, everybody has an N95 mask that's in the pre-op area, PPE, no visitors are in there, waiting rooms are closed. So all of our, we actually use our waiting rooms for our lunch staff, for our staff. So, and then the, we do the preoperative decolonization. And I actually do this as well on myself for the last week. Uh, for the nasal pharynx, and that's with betadine. Now, there's a lot of in vivo and in vitro uh, data on it from the past, but it, it looks like betadine 10% is actually the one that's got the best antiviral. I, I've become an, a viral expert in the last month because I've reviewed about 80 articles on it. So betadine looks like it's, it's a great antiviral, better than antibacterial, believe it or not. And there's a lot of studies that are coming up, like one from NYU, one from Stanford, and hopefully they'll be able to randomize it, but you know, some of them are still pending. But the data on the in vivo and vitro in the past with other coronaviruses has been pretty good. So that's what we use. And we don't use, and don't use this, this is an American joke, but, uh, but there is some data also on hypochlorous acid, which is also an antibacterial. And it's a very, very dilute uh, form of um, bleach, but it actually, it does have some antiviral activity. And so this actually also is being studied now across the board. So, but data is really, really not out there yet on all the antivirals. Chlorhexidine, believe it or not, is not a good antiviral, uh, which surprised me, it's Peridex. Transamic acid actually is a great antiviral. And there's some data that's now, I, there's two um, trials that are being launched for IV and for outpatient and inpatient, because it does prevent, the, it, break, it breaks down the, the antiviral membrane and also it actually may have an effect um, on, um, on the, the breakdown of the virus from plasminogen to plasmin, which of course is antifibrinolytic activity. So I actually have always in the last five years have used it IV, um, the gram of IV anyway. So, so it may have some potential positivity. So this, this is hopeful, but the clinical trials are pending. So betadine is the best. I like to use it four to one moth gargle that actually doesn't stain your teeth. It's still above what the published studies are. You can mix it with your favorite moth gargle. I actually use Colgate, but it, it doesn't really matter. You can gargle with it. You can actually, uh, you can use it for your irrigation. All my patients, um, like I said, all my patients, including the non um, rhinoplasties have used it, have had zero complaints. They actually like it. They swish it for about 15, 20 seconds before surgery. Um, 
And then in the operating room, the key here is everybody's in full PPE, N95s, face shields. And the other thing that's been touched upon is we have a high OR air exchange and, and you have to have at least uh, 25 exchanges per hour, hours to get a 98, 99% viral clearance. And our OR is 40 exchanges per hour. So every one of your ORs, you should be able to cal calculate that. And that's important. And we leave the room for eight minutes when, when, when that happens. And then we, uh, and the, the door is not open except for, uh, and we're texting. So we have, we have actually whiteboards outside says when intubated, when you can come back in. So my circulator texts me when I can come back in. And then of course the face is prepped with a full betadine prep. The mouth is prepped four to one. The nasal pact is four to one with Afrin, Moist and Pledgets. And we use uh, nasal swabs that are full strength. So basically uh, it's a betadine uh, shower show and we've put the throat pack in and, uh, and then I use an occlusive dressing. Uh, I'd use Tegaderm. That helps to further um, prevent any type of aerolization uh, when you're doing that. And then of course we're coming in and we're fully dressed. And, and, I, and I empathize with nausea because I tell you, after about two hours with an N95, and I actually wear a mask on top of this. So it, it gets like you're pretty hip, hypoxic or hyperemic <laughs> or hypokypnic. And we're in full protective eye gear. And um, so that's, that's kind of the quick uh, overview of that. And in the last two minutes, I'm just gonna talk about rhinoplasty with, or uh, fillers. And basically it's a similar thing. And, and we use in, in our office, uh, we basically prep and have always prepped with chlorhexidine because it's the best antibacterial for any fillers. But what we now do the mouthwash gargle for the patients as well. And then we do for right up for nasal fillers, I swab them with a, um, a beta 9 swab inside the nose. And that really is what we're doing here. And this patient that I just did the other day. So basically we will swab them and then I'll prep, uh, then I'll prep the inside of their nose with that. And we will uh, do that bilaterally. And, and then, then we'll do the filler, and of course, with shields on. And then the key also, when you're doing a filler, make sure that when you're doing it, that you're, you're actually occluding the, uh, the nostrils and, not, and trying not to be inside the, uh, any type of mucosa when you're doing that, so that when you finish, then you can actually, you know, so minimally, minimally palpate that. And, uh, and I think that's one of the things that they, they've got to be careful of. So. Um, so with that, I will leave you with being safe, uh, you know, operate only on COVID negative patients to the best of your knowledge, you know, protect yourself and your staff, use chlorhexidine for skin prep, especially in, in, the, um, in, in the fillers and then in the nostrils and any with nasal mucosa, use betadine. And of course, just remember, we need to validate all of these. It's constantly evolving and let's try and stay science and fact-based and, and always be willing to say, I don't know, because honestly, we don't know. And, and obviously, as Sam and others have said, put the patient's safety first. So thank you. Thank you, Rod. That was excellent. And I think we should have some discussion before uh, we have uh, Dr. Hogg talk uh, about the, uh, the findings from the RSC uh, webinar that was a couple weeks back. So uh, just to open the discussion. Can I ask yeah. a question of Sam? Shoot, Rick. Sure, you, you might not get an answer, but sure. <laughs> well, I'm impressed that the um, sensitivity of your PCR is 96%. How, how do we go about that? What are we doing wrong? So this was uh, this is a, a, a test developed with in-house at Stanford by one of the, uh, the... So they're just probing a different part of the RNA or... No, that's, that's not... I mean, Jeff was talking about 99% of Duke, so... Yep. Um, it's not that much. But is it really been validated to be that, Sam? Because, I mean, everybody says they are that, but is it really? You know, I, I wasn't part of that. Well, actually, I was part of that process accidentally. <laughs> but uh, the, uh, but I, I trust them that they've, that they've been able to validate it. They've done tens of thousands of, of uh, people, apparently, and that's what they found. So 
Well, I know that the, the technique of probing the airway is, you know, well, no, I, mean, a couple I was tested and I asked the person doing it and they said, I've never done this and no one showed me how to do it. So I, I took a Q-tip along and I said, look, you don't go up to the um, olfactory yeah. bulb and rupture through the cribriform. You go this way. And she goes, yeah, I, can, oh. I, can, I can speak to being tested because I was tested four times. But the first time I was tested was actually a flu test. So they just did a middle turbinate swab. That ended up being positive. I mean, we already talked about this. Um, so that, that worked. Uh, and then uh, a nasopharyngeal swab was the second time. I can tell you the last time I had it done and I've been tested negative twice was I did feel like they were going to sample my, uh, my pituitary because they, they put that thing in there all the way back, held it for 10 seconds, and then twirled it for five seconds with a full 1001, 1002 count, and then took it out. That's, so well, I they were doing both that, sides that at, the, at the clinic here. So Yeah, so if that was negative, it was going to be negative. And I think one of the one of the people posted a question or a point, which is that the PCR test tests RNA, not live viral particles. So, you know, <clears throat> I was confident when that was negative, that I was truly negative, that it would have found any little dead particle of virus that was in there that could potentially give you a false positive. But, but they're not all probing the same gene sequence. There's There's more than yeah, one correct. you know yeah, I, uh, I, I, codon I, that they're that they're probing so i can't speak to the exact is that the stanford test but it's considered uh, a high quality test and yeah. for us you know we don't take tests i think jeff talked about this or someone else did we don't take tests from uh, only take tests from particular places the only places outside of stanford will accept the test basically around here at ucsf uh and and uh, i think davis so we won't take uh, a test result and, and consider it consider it a valid test unless it's from one of those places. Yeah. Can I weigh in here, Jake? You, you yeah, well, go ahead, Dr. Dr. Berkowitz. A um, lot of, try to change the signal to noise ratio here a little bit. The, um, there's the practicality. Sam's at Stanford, I'm in Santa Clara County in the shadow of Stanford. I don't have the, Berkowitz and Zeidler don't have the same access to testing that Sam most has at Stanford. And I think that's true for most of our listeners here. So what is really out there that's available that is, high, that is highly reliable? And that is LabCorp's nasopharyngeal swab PCR test that, uh, that Jeff Marcus mentioned. And we do that two weeks before the surgery at the time of the pre-op. And then we that screens them out. If they're positive, they are, we change the schedule. We push them out. And if they're negative, they're quarantined for two weeks. And we run a second test three to four days ahead. And that will be the pixel test from LabCorp that the patient can order, delivered by FedEx. They, they, it's the anterior and areas. It's not all the way back. Very high specificity. It's gotten good reviews. Send, it gets FedEx back to LabCorp and you'll have you'll have an answer in 40, 24 to 48 hours. The saliva test, which we thought was gonna be our godsend, we spent hundreds of dollars, thousands of dollars on saliva tests for our patients. And we found that they were so backed up in the lab, they were four weeks out on giving us results. So as wonderful as that test is, it is probably, that, that company is not really up to speed yet. The ideal thing is a point of care test. And that's what Sam has. He has a Cepheid test. I can't get Cepheid tests at Berkowitz and Zeidler. We're trying to get McKesson, um, Henry Shane, and Fisher, and Cardinal Health all have access to the new SOFIA test, S-O-F-I-A, from Quindell out of San Diego. And that test is supposed to be very accurate point of care tests that we could do on the day of surgery or the day before surgery. These are things that will be practically available to our listeners. Sure. You. Uh, you know, I'd like to hear also from, uh, sorry, go ahead. Can I say a few things? Yeah, okay. absolutely. Dr. Guyron. Yeah. First of all, as being, being the oldest person on this uh, panel, I'm going to really appeal to the sense of uh, realism. You listen, you're listening to so many variations of uh, uh, the preoperative care. First of all, we need to make sure that when the, we take the temperature, which is in my view, one of the most uh, uh, important reliable guards, 
we need to make sure that the patient is not, is not any medications that uh, may reduce or take away fever, like it's being on steroids or taking Tylenol or any other medications. Uh, second, when we talk about I don't do such a thing, we need to be careful. Those are the ones that actually they're going to come back and haunt us. Those are the ones that the lawyers are going to review these uh, 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 webinars and just, oh, oh, so and so said that I don't do this. We have to have a really good reason for not doing it. I heard several people tell us that I don't use, I understand that packing, packing actually uh, can cause uh, serious infections, problems on somebody who doesn't have a, uh, any virus disease. But what is the reason for not using, for example, dolly stents? What, what, what do we have? What do we have against it? Or to even turbinectomy, yeah, wait, we, 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 we have to be careful we do you know, conservatively anyway. So I think that we need to be careful about the things that we say that they are, I don't do it. That, those are the ones that is going to give the law, lawyers a reason to come after us if something goes wrong. And I think it is important for us to just set the stage properly and yes, do some tests. And for example, about the out of out of town patients, um, uh, what Rod is doing, yes, it is a very radical thing. How practical that is, uh, or what uh, ha, uh, Ash is doing. Uh, not every patient has uh, a jet. So what I do is have That's them true. tested before they come to see me. When they come to see me, when they get in town, we do another test. I tell them use mask in the airplane and. Uh, and sanitize the hands. And I think those are the things that, and if I don't do out of town, out of country patients for, uh, uh, for, um, for, uh, for the period that we don't know when that's going to be, uh, my practice is going to be uh, down to 20%, 30%. That's not sustainable. So we really need to use common sense and realistic facts and also things that they really have been proven. Others, Common sense is going to guide us what to do. Yeah. Jay, can I say something real quick? Absolutely, go ahead, Ash, and then Dr. Rorick next. So yeah, so I guess I misspoke. I didn't say it in absolute terms. I'm only doing people with private jets. So let me clarify. So until June 1st, we don't have anyone in the schedule that's out of town except for one person that happens to have a private jet. And that's why I made it exception. And the only re reason I'm waiting till June is just because I want this first two weeks to kind of go by for us to get our bearings and see how the flow is going to be because this is all new to us. I've never had to check temperature of a patient, have them knock on the door and come in. I've never had to wait for an outside lab test to come in. What if they're backed up and my whole schedule gets screwed up? So there's a lot of logistical problems with this. In theory, everything we're saying sounds great. But me personally, I do have a plan and I do have, I have patients booked all through the summer. And a lot of them are out of town, just like yourself, Dr. Guyron. So what I did is they have to get tested after they land and they have to demonstrate that over seven days, they have no symptoms. They do a symptom log. And if necessary, I test them again. And there is a test in LA that has a 48 hour turnaround, but I'm not gonna cut it close. So they might get two tests, but I'm waiting till they fly. If they're exposed the next day after they land, they get a COVID test and they have to quarantine themselves for a week now I might change this, but seven days before surgery, they cannot come into the office. So, and then all new patients are being done virtually. So I have no follow-ups. If anyone says my nostril, this and that, tough luck. If you wanna to go to Yelp, go for it. I'm not seeing you right now, that's not an emergency. We're seeing basically new consults with virtual, extra people are not allowed to accompany our patients. They wait in the car, we text them when they can come pick them up from the hallway. So in our space that we're protecting, we're not a, a hospital that can have positive pressure, or I'm sorry, negative pressure space. So nobody's coming into my office who doesn't have a COVID negative status. That's it. But, but that flying in that town, we to have to just wait for the certain time period. Um, and you know, the other practicality is I wore an N95 mask when I was pre oping five people on Friday and they were all spaced apart. I could barely breathe. I had to take that max mask off when I went into the back room and just breathe. I don't know how for those of us, especially that do cases that require a little more energy like liposuction or a tummy tuck. 
I don't see how I'm going to wear an N95 the whole time without, you know, passing out of CO2 poisoning. So um, we have to talk about practicality too. And how, how, how long do we need to wear an N95? Is it just during the, you know, the initial phase of the surgery? Do we switch it out? Uh, or are we just having it if we have to assist in intubation, extubation? The only person in the room that's going to have intubation, extubation is going to be my nurse with an N95 assisting if they need cricoid pressure or something and the anesthesiologist, and we're waiting 10 minutes to enter. But I mean, these are all theories. They're all yeah. theories. Uh, well, General okay. Ash, I think we need theories, to make though. sure that the patient is tested before the patient comes in town, because if they come in town and they're positive, they're gonna send, you're gonna send the patient back. You're going to uh, uh, right. have the patient to contaminate the airplane right. and all kinds of things. I think they need to, be tested before they come in town. Okay, yeah, you know, I, I agree with actually, that. I addressed Go ahead, Rod. my uh, with my ID person who, who was on the Ebola task force bomb, and I agree we need to use common sense because, you know, when I say I cancel, I'm actually I'm just pushing him out. You know, if if, if she has told me if you're from a true hotspot in the United States, uh, you need to if you're going to have it done, you need to come to Texas, Dallas two weeks before, get tested, and then get tested again three to four days before. If you're not from a hotspot, you come, you wear a regular mask. And then you get tested when you hit the ground like three to five days before in Dallas. So that's that's really what it is, because I'm like you. I mean, half of my patients are from around the US and a lot from around the world, but I'm not doing any outside of, well, I have a patient that's coming from Guam, but he's on an air base, so he's secure. But but you know, we have to use just practical stuff that makes sense. And the best thing we have to do is be uniform so that all of the criteria when we get asked is that we've done that for everybody. And I agree with you about the temperature. I mean, that's really probably the most important frontline thing because I don't think we should rely so much. I think testing can get you into trouble because we're lulled into complacency because I don't care how many people on this call say that their tests are so accurate. I can tell you the data would not support that your, your, your test is 95% accurate. The data would say it's 70, 85% accurate. And that's why some hospitals are not using the Abbott anymore. And so we have to be very careful. And to answer Larry's question, every one of those tests is local. You know, Quest may be great, uh, um, CPR may be another. So, I mean, I just tell people it works for me in Dallas. And I can tell you, you know, we finally have the saliva test that works for us in over in 36 to 48 hours, but it's so local and, Stan, and Sam is great because he's in Stanford, but I think we just have to be very practical. And, and, and Ash, take the waiting, take him out of the waiting room, get rid of the tape, don't let him come in. They just will violate it. I can tell you. That's right. I don't trust my I don't trust myself, my staff, or my partners. So guess what? We all voted to just we we actually have the the uh, the, the the chairs barricading the reception area. I know it looks terrible, but let's just let's just not let them come in there. Wait, they can wait in the car. Yeah, they that's wait in the car. And you know what? Do you know you know what the amazing thing, the most amazing thing in this whole crisis has been? You know who's been the best? The patients. It's unbelievable. I mean. And these are patients that, you know, used to wear us out, you know, like, you know, say, oh, Dr. Rick, is this a little swelling here? They've been unbelievable. I must say, I'm shocked by that. So pleasantly so. You know, it's actually been our patients. Our staff's been good. You know, my personal staff has been excellent. Some of my, my OR staff, honestly, I'm doing a lot of the testing for them because I am really, really, you know, there's a lot of angst. Now, it's calmed down a lot in the last two weeks because they have to understand and feel that you're being safe. That's the most important thing that we're being safe for them and for us. That's why that's why they all love the 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 the, the beta nine gargle. I'm actually doing the beta nine wash myself, and anything I can do to decrease my viral load, that's okay too. Well, let's uh, in terms of what to do and how to do it with the uh, Rhinoplasty Society of Europe uh, webinar a couple of weeks back. I'd like Martin to uh, go through uh, the salient findings. And then we'll we'll open up for a big discussion and take some questions from our uh, our webinar uh, participants. So, uh, Martin, can you uh, sh share your screen and go ahead? Yeah. Thank you, Jay. Uh, it's a great pleasure and honor for me to be here and part of this. Um, and I would like to share with you my presentation. All right. Everybody sees it. Yep, it's perfect. Okay, great. So uh, my name is uh, Martin Hoek. I'm working as a plastic surgeon at the University Hospital in Basel. And I am the chair of the scientific committee of the RSE 
And in terms of this, we conducted this webinar two weeks ago. Unfortunately, the video is not running very well, but uh, uh, no problem. We invited several international experts and opinion leaders on rhino surgery. Um, we uh, brought together several questions in different categories. And the aim of the webinar was to, uh, to get consensus on uh, important questions, how to get back to the OR uh, in the safest way uh, possible. So I'd, li I'd like to share with you the results. Um, as I said before, we had four sessions uh, with different questions. Um, the first session was about outpatient consultation. Uh, these were the questions, the voting that we performed during the webinar um, and the results and recommendations that we draw, the panel draw out of this um, uh, votings. So the, uh, the red ones are uh, the consensus, which means more than 75% of the panelists agreed to this question. The blue ones are no consensus, but uh, majority, it's lower than 75%, but it's still the majority. So uh, consensus could be reached on the necessity to screen the patients uh, by using phone or a questionnaire in terms of COVID, COVID uh, symptoms. And if the uh, patients reveal symptoms, uh, then the recommendation and consensus is to perform a RT-PCR test uh, before the patients are coming to your private practice. So in the practice, social distancing, of course, is important as, as that has been mentioned before. Um, uh, concerning a COVID area, uh, the panelists recommend to have a kind of COVID area or at least a room where you may separate high-risk patients in private practice. Um, if you are handling with uh, low-risk patients, FFP1 masks are good for the patient and the healthcare workers. That's uh, the, the majority of the panelists agree to this. And in case of high-risk patients, and in case uh, that high-risk maneuvers are necessary during the outpatient control, FFP2 and 3 masks or N95 masks plus shield are recommended. Uh, increased airflow turnover strongly is recommended by the panelists. Um, also, there is no uh, consensus on this. Standard disinfection of high-touch surfaces, this is a consensus should be carried out after each patient contact. So coming to the second session, free of patient assessment. Again, these, are, these were the questions, the voting on these questions by the panelists and the results and recommendations. So the adaption of the medical history taking in terms of asking for fever, fever dry cough, sore throat uh, is of utmost importance. Um, this gives a very good orientation about the status of, of the patient. Uh, also, the panelists recommend um, to carry out pre of RT-PCR tests two days prior to the operation, not two times and not five or seven days prior to the operation, but only one time and two days uh, prior to the operation. Uh, Preoperative self-quarantine is recommended by the panelists, although this is no consensus. Antibody tests are not useful at the moment um, because false negative results are too high and cross reaction may be present. Also, there is, uh, to the knowledge of the panelists, there is only one validated test for uh, this virus. This, uh, uh, another question was uh, uh, should we carry out a steady rhino uh, The panelists um, agreed, the majority agreed to really, really very conservatively draw the indication for aesthetic rhinoplasty and if it's possible just postpone to a later date. Um, on the other side, functional rhinoplasties are appropriate uh, to carry out at the moment. This is a consensus. Given the fact that in the operation room, personal uh, protective equipment is used in an adequate way. So session three, uh, different interoperative measures uh, in terms of improving safety. Uh, again, the questions, the votings, powered instruments, piezo, laminar airflow, 
the recommendations of the panelists were again a consensus on carrying out antiseptic packing prior to surgery and intranasal pharynx uh, disinfection. Betadine, this has also been mentioned before by Rod, uh, has proven its, um, its value in uh, the treatment of other SARS uh, viruses, Ebola virus, norovirus, and it works very good. It lowers or there is no virus load uh, detectable after use uh, of um, betadine. So coming to the situation in the OR, if aerosol generating maneuvers are carried out, the panelists agreed uh, to recommend to use FFP2 or three masks or N95, and part instruments are known to generate aerosol during the operation. Still, the panelists uh, were not um, willing to prohibit the use of uh, powered instruments and piezo, but at least the panelists strongly recommend uh, that these instruments should be used in a very differentiated way and maybe only simple bone maneuvers without extensive mucosal defects should be carried out and use uh, cold instruments whenever you have the feeling that this works the same way. Laminar airflow again is strongly recommended also there is no uh, no consensus on this session four about legal aspects and problems again the questions the votings and the recommendations of the panelists consensus um, has been reached uh, concerning the fact that complication rate may be higher while operating on uh, uh, patients with undetected COVID-19 infection or patients which are getting cross-infected during the operation. Uh, consensus could also be reached concerning the, the importance to adapt the informed consents in terms of cross-infection of patients and the risk of this. Um, another thing uh, uh, is the responsibility of the surgeon. Uh, is he responsible for the complication, for the higher complication rate? Uh, the panelists agree that um, uh, the surgeon is not responsible because uh, if a patient is cross-infected during performing of rhinosurgery, this could be, could be considered as a complication and not as a malpractice. Again, a question was discussed uh, whether to resume to elective surgery at the moment is appropriate and uh, the recommendation of the panelists are uh, to really conservatively draw the indication for aesthetic rhinoplasty, postpone if it's possible and resume uh, to functional rhinoplasty at the moment is appropriate. So that's about it and thank you for your attention. I can't hear you. Sorry, that's a that's an excellent summary from uh, that webinar because those questions were posed to people that had some had already started doing surgery, some were thinking about it. Uh, here in Los Angeles, we're starting up this week, so I think uh, from uh, the aspect of hearing from the experts in Europe, uh, that's a very valuable. Uh, webinar with those uh, questions being answered. I'm glad you could share them with the uh, rhinoplasty society here in the U.S. Uh, I do want to open up for discussion, and I know, Dr. Jake, what, one question. Yeah. Would you allow me to do the first comment on my presentation? Uh, absolutely. Go right ahead. And then uh, Dr. Robati, uh, I know, has already asked me to get in there, too. I, I think we should handle this, these recommendations in a very differentiated way because um, mainly these recommendations are based on expert opinion. And as we all know, the evidence is, is very poor on several aspects, also on several questions that has been posed and discussed in this webinar. Um, also, the panelists agreed that um, there is a necessity or need to repeat this webinar maybe in six months with a better evidence base at that time. Uh, and one thing which is very important, panelists do not see these recommendations as a kind of rule book or uh, de definitive best practice guidelines. I think it's very important. Everybody who is uh, taking under consideration to use these recommendations 
has to adapt these recommendations to the local situation, the local rules, and the local recommendations of the hospital and the official authorities. I think this is very important uh, to, to tell everybody. I agree 100%. This is, uh, that, and that's why my opening comments were please to understand that this is not, these are not, uh, we're not a regulating body, we're not a governing body. We are uh, rhinoplasty surgeons with an extreme concern for safety of our patients, our staff, and ourselves. So uh, with that, uh, Dr. Robati, you, you had some well, comments Jay, you wanted to make. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me as well. I, I have a main worry which is dangling in my mind, and it's partly been already stated by Barman. But after saying that, we've, we have all picked very useful things these days, PCR, antibody tests, distancing, PPPs, self-quarantine. I am implying everything, in all this in my office and I've not started operating, we should start at the end of May. But having said this, I have one concern. Actually, I have two big concerns. Number one, how can I bear physically a way of operating which is so unuseful, for, unused to me? I've, I've made some patients dressings, uh, if I, I, not dressings because I've not operated anybody yet, but I've looked into some people's noses with this stuff, and I'm wondering how I can do a rib which will last me five hours. And having said this, I have one intellectual doubt. If we are reasonably confident, which is the main thing, to take someone in the OR who is negative, meaning who is, to the best of our knowledge, non-COVID patients, then should we renounce on the quality? I mean, why should we not put Doyle splints in a nose? Barman has already said this. Why should I not use power tool if I love power tools and I have a good uh, relationship with them, and why should they use, not use piezo on a bone which has not been in contact with any mucosa? So, if I renounce of, on all these things because somebody tells me to do so, otherwise it can become medical, legal, even dangerous, I don't even think I should begin. So I have a big intellectual honesty issue here. I'm not going to renounce on my quality. And to get quality, I need to do certain things. And if these certain things are criticized for many reasons, maybe I shouldn't do them. <laughs> well, criticism is different than data. And yeah. I have to tell you that, you know, I get very uncomfortable with things that are, that are stated in absolute terms, uh, sorry, absolute terms that uh, are, are exclusionary uh, or e exclusive to certain techniques or certain ways of doing things when we don't have any data. So I think if it's uncomfortable for me to use Doyle splints, then that's for, for me to decide for me. But if I'm comfortable with Doyle splints, I believe I have a COVID negative patient and nobody can tell me otherwise that using Doyles or not using Doyles, there's no data to show it, then I'm gonna use my own best judgment. And so everybody has to decide for themselves in these times until there's data telling them otherwise. You don't wanna, equality is number one, you have to do a great job for your, for your patient. Absolutely. And whatever it takes for you to do that, you have to gain a level of comfort that you're doing the right thing for them and keeping themselves, them, yourself, and your staff safe. Right. And, hey, I, and um, I think one thing- Rod, go ahead. Just to remember, just because it's published does not necessarily mean it's true. For As sure. editor of our major journal in plastic surgery, okay, just because something's published does not mean it's true. And I can see that from that recent article because it makes absolute no sense about not using oil splints or anything like that. No, mucosa from turbinate, maybe there's some, in, but there's no data on that, but at least it has some, some type of common sense from as a rhinoplasty expert as all of us are, but the Doyle splints thing, and I also agree, if you Rod, get the result Rod, you I, want, you shouldn't do it. Let me just chime in just because I had mentioned the Doyle splints at the beginning and it isn't, the, you know, it's not the, that, that using them, you know, the, that, the, that the, uh, placement of the of the splint is a problem. The problem is when they come back, you know, five to seven days later, and you're going to remove them. And the first thing they do as soon as you remove the this the splints is they either sneeze or they blow their nose, and that's that's the issue. It's not you know, it's not the placement of them or the fact that they're there. But we're we're in the same N95s as we are in the OR, uh, Jeff. And, you know, having done exactly. you know, ten of them now, or 
I mean, we're wearing the same thing. I wear the same things I wear in the OR. That's the difference. And I actually even have an, an RX air, emulsi air emulsifier. No, it's not as good as the OR, but we, we do the same thing. And I think, well, here's, here's, here's the bottom line. Let me just say this real quick. What Dr. Uh, what Enrico said is correct. If we're assuming we're doing all this stuff that everyone coming into our space, when I say space, I mean OR, clinic, whatever it is, is COVID negative and our staff's COVID negative. And I would suggest we test our, ourselves and our staff once a month, at least in this initial phase. Um, then no technically, you know, no, I, would, I would disagree with that, but go ahead, Gash, keep going. I, I mean, I'm just recommending that we consider that because we don't know the data and, uh, and I'll get back to the data thing real quick because that's important too. Um, the frequency of visits will matter. Now, whether they're coughing, sneezing, we can't control that. I mean, I have allergies and I cough and sneeze all the time in the morning and I'm probably gonna scare my staff's deathless. And I've already warned them, you guys, I cough and sneeze in the morning, I have allergies, I have issues. I have a huge septal deviation, I have to go see someone. But the point is that if someone's COVID negative coming in, then you have to trust that five, seven days later when you're removing the spin, you're already letting him into your office. Now if, you, now, if you have a doyle or not, they're already in your space. So as from a liability standpoint, if that person turns up to be COVID negative, whether you use the doyle or not is not going to change that for your staff's comfort, for yourself, et cetera. And as Rod said, in the clinic, we can be a little more relaxed because we're not wearing it for two, three hours straight. Wear all your gear when you're examining these patients, when you're removing their splints. Um, and, their, and their doyles do it very carefully. Use suction. I have that whole little ENT thing in the side that has suction and it has everything on. So, um, you know, uh, so anyway, I, I think we have to assume everyone's COVID negative. So go ahead and do that. And the recommendations are going to change. And, you know, there was one time where they actually said smoking might help this. And, I, and we all know how Rod feels about smokers. I was worried he was going to go get a pack of Marble Reds and start. So I, I made sure I was going to call him. But um, the data is going to change from time to time. It, it's not something that's rigid. And the problem with data collection is, and I would suggest, since we're all doing something slightly different, the data is going to be skewed if we do something prospective. It would be nice if a group of us could have the same things that we're doing so that we can do some kind of prospective study where we have three to five people in this panel who are doing the same things for the next six months and use that data to help our local organizations and the entire medical community by being in such an industry that's considered high risk as rhinoplasty and being the expert. So I would suggest we consider doing something similar in protocol and do some prospective study with uh, numerous surgeons that's going to be useful. And then we can look at that in six months and say, Rod, Ash, Jay, and Sam Most, you know, did this exact same thing for six months. And then looking back, no COVID patients, or there was one COVID patient, nothing happened. Like, that's going to be useful data. Sam, Just a quick go ahead, shoot. I was going to latch on to the, the discussion about the Doyle splints and the turbinate reduction. It's all about risk mitigation. So, you know, doing turbinates for me, I've continued to do them but intraoperatively. I guess the risk is the cautery. I do a very small amount of cautery on the anterior head of the turbinate. I don't use any marker beater. I take a little bit of bone out and out fracture it. And the second risk is in the post-op period, taking out the dual splints, which I still use, which um, it's pretty rare for them to sneeze and cough and stuff. Yeah. But really the biggest risk is the suction you use on your SMR cart. That's what that's called, Ash. <laughs> called the SMR cart. Uh, so not the little thingy the otolaryngologists use. So, uh, so that, that, uh, that suction, you know, generates aerosol. So you, we have to get inline filters for the right. single use inline filters for that. And the third thing is we have actually installed this big, ugly um, HEPA filter, which created one of my exam rooms to be a negative pressure room. Because if you generate aerosols or think you did in a room, you can't use it for three hours unless it has high circulation. So most clinic exam rooms aren't set up like that. I showed a picture of that before. It's a really yeah. big ugly thing. They're going to retrofit our building so that all the rooms have that, uh, have the HEPA filtration. But so, I mean, those are just things. Everyone's going to be different. Uh, every practice is going to be different, um, and the way you do things is going to be different. So it's all about your locality and what you have available to you and doing what you think is going to be best for risk mitigation. For Hey, can I say one more thing? Yeah, we're going to go around. I want to get uh, last comments. So go ahead, Dr. Guyron. Okay. Ash gave you some statistics, and I agree with that. I think 
this is uh, the fear of this virus has paralyzed all of us for, for the last three, two or three months. And it is a reality. It is there. It is something that we need to be careful about. But changing the way we do the things drastically is not necessary. And we really need, again, to be realistic about what is that we are doing? What are the possibilities that under the conditions that we all uh, uh, reiterate, actually repeat it several times, that we're going to have actually somebody who's going to get, uh, have the virus, which is one in so many, so much, uh, uh, one out of hundred, uh, two out of a hundred of them are going to be in a hospital, and one out of or two out of those hundred, a uh, 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 small percentage are going to uh, have to be in the intensive care unit. This is something that is uh, really. Uh, we need to understand, be realistic about it, know, but I also we need to be careful about what we do and uh, implement some of the, the measures that they are sensible, not to get out of control and worry about it so much that we change everything that we do. Thank you. I want to have uh, Dr. Davis, uh, final comments. I think this is still in my mind a tough a tough thing to to grapple with um, you know when we start talking about potential mortality for a purely cosmetic elective procedure that that sobers me up quickly. Um, this is a highly communicable disease, and unfortunately, it appears from the early literature and I'm not talking about that. A uh, paper out of Wuhan, but this this um, uh, consortium of of uh, collaborators, Th this viral infection at the time of any surgery could conceivably accelerate the disease. That patient may have gotten it in the community and been able to sleep through it at home. After ten days, they're they're feeling fine, but because of the stress of surgery, maybe nutritional depletion, maybe uh, hormonal changes, maybe uh, immunologic changes, and the fact that they have to heal the wounds that's the reservoir of the infection. That could conceivably be a, a game changer if it happens at the time of surgery. That's my biggest fear. That's what's keeping me up at night. Granted, the probability that we'll operate on somebody with the disease probably pretty small and depending on where you live probably very small but there's still a chance that some you know 16 year old kid could not be around because they picked the wrong time to have their nose surgery and uh, I'd have a hard time living with that personally so I'm giving very serious consideration of just retiring from medicine very serious uh, what it's worth. I, you know what, Jay? I think after that negative statement from somebody, Rick, that I really like and trust a lot, who's considering retiring from the surgery because of this, uh, I, I, I may be considering retiring sometime in the future, but it's not going to be because of this virus. Well, it, I have it, I have it. some other other concerns. I was hit by a different kind of virus uh, six months ago. I was my office was hit with a cyber attack and. Uh, that that hurt me more than this COVID did. Yeah, but, but I understand. Uh, I, I really am. All of that collectively, I'm just thinking. You know, the cost of of getting HIPAA filters in my office and da 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 da. da all, you know, and the fact that I may still not be able to create a safety net that's good enough to protect my patients. Yeah, I, I, just, I I'm, I, I'm 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 not saying that I'm criticizing anybody else. I'm just. I have to act on my own conscience and what I feel is appropriate. And I'm struggling with this. I'll be honest with you. I'm this not is convinced what's true yet. for you. I mean, yeah. for Rick I Davis, that's, that. from, well, that's what is true. That. Can I just finish it? I understand that, but you obviously have, unfortunately, because of the negative exp experience, so you're loaded for, with the, uh, uh, all the negative things that can possibly happen, but this should not get us down. This should, get us more realistic about the things that we do and what we do, how we do it, and 
when the statistics tell us that actually under the circumstances, the way we behave ourselves or protect our patients, we can actually have a single patient in the operating room who's going to get uh, a 16 year old going to die, then we obviously would stop doing what we were doing. But right. a fear of that should not really make us stop what we, what we are doing. I agree. Go ahead, Rod. Okay. Final comments from Rod Roark, I agree. Please. You know, we have to stay, stay and be positive. We must focus. You cannot change the past. You cannot change the future. You can only change the present. And in the present, we must stay, you know, science-based, fact-based, because there's a lot of non-science out there. And, and I, I, you know, I respect and, and love Rick as well. And I think in that cohort, though, what puzzled me was when they said that same cohort, the mortality ordinarily would be 8.3%. Now, if we have an 8.3% death in the rhinoplasty, we should not be doing any surgery in any patient in aesthetic surgery or rhinoplasty. So I would say we will get through this. We will be stronger than ever. We just have to have the precautions and do the right thing for our patients, put patient safety first. We're going to get through this and be stronger and actually be better than ever before because we'll use common sense. I'm not gonna, I'm, I have not changed my rhinoplasty technique. Now, I don't, I don't do a lot of turbinectomies. I, I haven't changed my rhinoplasty technique because if I have to change to get the same result, if I, if I can't get the same results, I'm not gonna operate on somebody. It's like saying I'm not gonna, I'm, I don't, that's why I don't operate on smokers because I don't like them and they'd get worse results. So I would say stay safe, stay focused, stay positive. We'll get through this, we'll be better together. Well, that's part of my problem. I do mostly six hour cases and, you know, tertiary, quaternary, pentenary, rhinoplasties, rib grafts, fascial grafts, da 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 da. And, there, and it becomes a kind of a major surgery in, in that uh, patient yep. cohort as opposed to a primary just needs some tip work. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm looking you. at a little bit higher mountain to climb at a time when. Uh, you know, operating with all this crap on your face and not being able to uh, use the entrance instruments you'd like to because of you putting your staff at risk or your patients at risk. Just, you know, it's a, it, it, uh, I don't know what to tell you. I hope all of you are successful. I hope every one of you has no problems whatsoever. I sincerely and honestly mean that. I would not wish well on or, or harm on anybody. I, but I just have to follow my own gut here. And so far, I'm, I'm very uh, undecided. I wish right. I had more time to think about it. But, uh, you know, you can't go without eating very long before you start to get hungry. So a, there, there is an economic component to this that we're kind of we're kind of dancing around. But, you know, uh, our practices are, are being decimated and people absolutely. depend on us for their livelihoods. And our kids need college tuition and, you know, we, et cetera, et cetera. I'm looking at losing my health insurance right now. And hey, uh, unfortunately, this I have, unfortunately, I have to get up because I have another commitment right now and past that. I apologize. I thank you for getting me uh, involved. And uh, uh, let's just think about the positive things in the future. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it, Bauman. Good thank you so much. With us, Bauman. Dr. Cherkish. Well, you know, me, you told me? Yes, please. Okay. Oh, I, I will tell you oh, my opinions. And uh, I, if I start to operate, I'm not going to use that N95 mask and uh, the shields because I, I believe that they will not uh, protect me 100%. If the patient is COVID positive, and uh, it is uh, it is my own risk, and uh, so uh, the quality of the uh, result is very important. If I will do the surgery, I am taking a risk, even though it is uh, it's very low, and uh, I will take uh, I will do all the measures and the tests not to operate an, uh, a COVID positive patient and to minimize the uh, risk of the uh, possibility of to uh, operate of the patient. This is important. I believe office patients coming uh, to my office who are not tested are, are even more risky than the patient I will operate because we, we do not test the patients uh, when they come to office, just uh, take an history. It's not possible so far. So, uh, 
And I don't think uh, all the measures mentioned can protect us uh, 100% if we operate a COVID positive patients. So that's why uh, I wouldn't change the, uh, you know, the, my operative technique. Uh, I, uh, actually, I don't use that uh, power instruments, but I don't see a reason not to use them. Also, you know, tur turbinate surgery uh, can, should be done. You know, if, uh, if you use suction, if the patient is really ca uh, is carrying the virus, is COVID positive, anyway, all these measures will not make too much sense. These are my, uh, my comments. Thank you, Nazim. Dr. Berkowitz. Yeah, I, I just wanted to tell everyone on this panel, you're all amazing people and I look up to you for all the good advice you've given. And Rick, we've all been where you are. We were forced into a two month vacation, the most exhausting vacation all of us have ever had. None of us ever, none of us got any sleep, um, but we're now on the front lines. That's the reality. You're moving to the front lines. And this is what I told our staff when we started doing surgery last week. We are now going to the front line and we have to conduct ourselves that way. And each case will be a little bit different. I have two practical things to offer for this group. I don't know if you can get my slides up, Jay. We, we don't have time, unfortunately. You can send it around to uh, Jeannie, she'll distribute it. I'll tell you very quickly. There are two practical things. Number one, we're intubating patients under a polyethylene clear plastic shroud. So, the, so the, the, what's being put in by the anesthesiologist with a video laryngoscope, the shroud's left on for 10 minutes, then taken off. That, minimize, that minimizes aerosolization into the room. It's a very, very practical way of doing intubation. Secondly, I purchased a Duramax dental aspirator. So we should be looking to our dental friends for advice. They're hurting worse than we are, especially the dental hygienists. And the way they're going back to work is with high volume vacuum, three level HEPA filter uh, uh, vacuums. Duramax is the name of the one I ordered from Bayes, B-E-Y-E-S, Dental out of Toronto. This machine's about $2,700. You put it underneath the patient's head and they've shown uh, smoke analysis. It just sucks everything right down under the patient, just like a, just like a Gen Air on your, on your stove. It, it's a practical thing to use. It's the only way the dentists are gonna be able to get back to work. They're back ordered now, but we can get them. There's a company in Wisconsin that makes them as well. It's a little bit noisier, um, but it's not, uh, uh, but it is readily available. I'm getting the one from Canada. So that's my two pieces of practical information if you're going to go back to the front lines. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Berkowitz. Dr. Marcus? You're, you're on mute. Thanks, Jay. It's getting a, late, a little late in the hour. I wanted to say thank you to uh, you and all the panelists. I think it's been very helpful. Great. Thank hey, Jay, you. Jay, can I say something real quick? So a statistic that this one... Um, actually social media person told me that I looked up and it was true. The average um, death, uh, age of death from COVID is the same as the average age of death. That's it's an important a, statistic. Yeah, interesting statistic. Hey, um, yeah, Dr. Sajadian. I, I can't. Yeah, go ahead, Sam. Go. Sam and then Dr. Sajadian. We can't, con you know, we can't mix this up with the flu. And I think, I don't know, I'm probably the only person here who had it, and I can tell you I was severely, severely ill, and I'm not afraid of the flu. Okay, so the morbidity isn't, he said 2% of people get hospitalized. That's not true. It's like 20 to 25% people can end up hospitalized, and it's very, very serious, um, even if the mortality rate is really low. And the reason why the mortality rate is low is because these people are being hospitalized and helped. So... I mean, just this isn't like the flu. I do take it very seriously. I don't think that we need to go as extreme as what Rick's talking about. I feel very sorry that he's feeling that way. On the other hand, I don't think we, I don't think we can avoid change in our practices. And I do think just like other things like using universal precautions after HIV and hep C and things, we're going to be doing things differently. And like Rod said, we're going to be safer and better for it. That's all I want to say. Okay. Ollie. Yes, um, I just wanted to share a couple of points that I made in my last slide quickly. 
for the benefit of um, our, um, the attendees. First of all, thank you, Jay, and everybody uh, for this fantastic webinar. Uh, I really think that we're learning new things about this virus every day. We should just stay nimble and um, flexible and, and adapt as we see. Um, and everything is really local. But because we don't know the tests, some, you know, we can argue that the tests are not 100%, definitely not 100%. They could be up to 80, 90%. So testing and retesting is the key for the pre-op of the patient. And just as, as you mentioned, making sure the patient is in this with us and staying quarantined pre-op and post-op in order to minimize our risk. Even if they're tested and negative, you can't really approach your surgery and say, oh, okay, it's, it's, it's guaranteed that they're negative. So you just have to keep those in mind. Thank you. Martin. Yeah. Jay, thank you very much again for having me with you. This, is, this was really a great webinar and uh, I learned a lot and I don't want to come over too pessimistic, but uh, uh, these days I had a long discussion with one of our infectiologists and uh, he told me that we have to live with uh, COVID. We cannot beat it, but we have to live with it. On the other side, this is the opportunity and as Rod said before, we will be stronger after this, uh, developing things, concepts uh, together and we, have to concentrate our power on getting more evidence-based. Maybe one of the best sayings this evening was uh, not fear-based, but evidence-based. And I already wrote the paper on the consensus uh, that we uh, made two weeks ago, and we have to develop this together and stick together. Thank you very much. Excellent. Dr. Robati, last but not Just least. Echo the same feelings. I. Uh... I was very sad actually to hear Rick's opinion because I don't think this is probably enough reason to get to such kind of choices, but uh, we just need data and in the meanwhile, we just have to face it. And we, the only way we face it is taking all the precautions possible, don't not bring in there who are people who are positive. And then once again, I do not think I should reduce my quality doing things under local anesthesia or uh, doing teleconsultations post-op exclusively, which in my opinion is not feasible and other things like this. I'm not prepared to that. Well, I think I local anesthesia is the worst. Why would someone yeah. go under local anesthesia? Well, that's a recommendation again from someone. That's ridiculous. I'm going to say that right out loud. That is ridiculous. I the know. best thing to be is intubated. Absolutely. Because you Absolutely. have a closed system. When you're under local anesthesia, and I've done cases you know, in, in my office in the OR, they're coughing, they're sneezing, they're coughing yeah, a lot. Absolutely. You're stimulating 100%. airway the entire time. It's the highest risk thing you can do. <laughs> All right, well, I wanna close up with every, everybody. I really appreciate the panelists for coming on, doing a great job. This is a very key topic for our practices. And uh, I will, uh, this will probably show up on the uh, TRS, uh, on the Rhinoplasty Society website. Uh, I'll make it available for the panelists as well, if you wanna put it up as well for people to see. And uh, I really uh, think this was important. And we, we will do this again soon after operating for three or four months. And I think we should kind of come up and, okay. and see where, what's working and what's not. I, I don't think we're even close to done with, uh, with discovering how good we can be for our patients. You bet. So thank you very much and uh, have a good one. You bet. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, gentlemen. Be safe. Be safe. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks.